Welcome back everyone to TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, English Mocha Lover. But right now, we need to talk about the regional unemployment and where to focus our unemployment efforts. So, I asked you guys that yesterday. Where should we focus? The North, the Midlands, or the South? And overwhelming support at the time of this recording at 9.41 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is the North. You guys really, really recommended the North, which is totally cool. Totally cool with me, and let's go with that, the poor North. Is it any wonder that the English North had the greatest number of Himmler supporters of any region in the country, considering how the central government has treated them on occasion? The North still suffers from the economic collapse of the 50s, unemployment is high, and industry is sparse. This makes it the perfect test bed for job creation measures. It'll be a hard slog to get to the citizenry of the North to go along, but should we manage it, it is entirely possible we could see the area turn into a bastion of United England support. When it comes to elections in this day and age, such a bastion has many uses indeed. Not to mention the improvements and the standards of living, of course. And poverty gets better and he gets more infrastructure. Very nice, my friends. Very nice. I uh, got a couple of comments to go through as well, but let's keep going. Oh, we're still... Oh, you guys are... Hmm. There you go. Go ahead and do that. Go ahead and get us a lot of naval speed that we don't really need. But, let's see. Oh, those guys are going to kill each other. Let's go to the next... I'll focus the next after this too. England revitalized. Yes, every own state, the state will gain a medium-large increase in... Depth. Economic output of domestic jobs. Wow, my pronunciations, like in every episode, are garbage. The rubble has been cleared and the streets have repaved. The shell holes have been filled in and tilled over. Where ruins once stood, buildings now reach towards the sky. And where the poor and destitute one line the streets, queuing for food and be begging for aid, they now stand in line for a new appliance or a seat at a fine restaurant. Oh, very good. England's domestic economy is back. The devastation of the Civil War has been fixed thanks to the government's economic reforms now. With this domestic situation fixed, England can now turn its attention to the world. It will become a major exporter again, and its goods will be available in every corner of the earth for eager buyers. Oh, look at that. So, a couple comments. Uh, someone says we should go with Montgomery's plan for like the military and stuff, which we might. We'll see what, oh, what we can do up here. Even though I really think we're going to go with another sea line. I'm not sure where Montgomery is at all, but we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. Oh, the DC is one in Italy? Cool. And someone says we should get more democratic support. Oh, uh, I guess we could, maybe? I just, I'm more focused on, I guess, support from Black Millionists. Demo democratization is how far the people have come to accept democracy, because right now, with 7%, uh, people are very extremely apathetic. So, yeah, it is what it is. And I want better poverty influence. Even though liberals get 1% more influence within the party for a whole city, that's not bad, but it's only 1%. Democratization, military loyalty would kind of increase. I kind of like that one. You know, I kind of like this one, too, but I don't want to get more millies for now. Um, anything else here that just jumps out at me? When we do modelings, modelings whenever when that when that happens, I will definitely just maximize democratization as much as possible. But I just jobs, just jobs is a four-letter word. So jobs, jobsy, jobsy, jobsy. But I do want to do a little bit of this as well. Oh, I guess we can't. We need to own Cornwall. To own Cornwall, we got to go over here too. Dealing with Cornwall. Outside Bristol is a barbed wire scar that cuts through the country and separates England from the Southwest Peninsula. Beyond it is Cornwall, a humiliation forced upon us by the Germans, particularly to keep us in line, but also keep a segment of England in eternal torment. One can see a painful reminder of what once was and what might be. But we are not the England of 1943, and we are no longer a nation that needs to have a sword of Damocles dangled permanently over its head. We will eliminate the garrison and then secure our eternal freedom. Let's hope so, because Volring, the fat man, that huge, laborious oaf, well, he's definitely got ideas for us, but England revitalized. Very, very, very nice. Dealing with those Don Cornish. We could probably cut that, cut that span, span up the butt for that right now. Oh, and I still gotta play as China. I really need to play as China sometime. A lot of you guys have recommended I play as either Yunnan or just both, either Yunnan or the other China, but ooh, of course the WWR front unifies that group. But like, yeah, you got a lot of you guys recommend I play as China sometime. So, which I will. I'm just not sure when. I just kind of. I haven't thought about China that much in TNO. Then again, after what the Japanese probably did to it, it's probably not very good. Probably not. Save her PP for now, but then, uh, hurt them deep? Oh, hurt them big and deep. Hot alert for us has been a nuisance for a long time. Any dream of a reformist was shot down because of fears of the garrison. Any sensible reform the reformers have proposed was blocked by fear of the garrison. If the garrison had not been there, we would be a democracy right now, with the UE working side by side with Auchinleck. The garrison will be removed, out of personal vendetta, yes, but also to force the reeling Reich to look up at us, with respect or face a prospect of another landing under the White Cliffs of Dover. The case for action. And so, a gun is pointed at us permanently, said Reginald Modling as he spoke through the camera, and to the people of England. As for the Prime Minister, I've directed that all measures be taken for defense, and we will take any action against foreign aggressors who threaten us. England, like it has so many times before, will rise to the challenge this poses us. 
Two, I know that many of you dread the prospect of another war, and indeed England has been soaked in more blood this century than ever before, but we must defend our way of life once more from those who would seek to destroy it. This country will make a stand once again for against foreign invasion. Scarcely a man believes that peace is so sweet that it is worth the price of change and slavery. We have resolved that England shall be defended to the last, and it shall. Thank you, and God save the king. The camera cut off. Modeling immediately looked up at Macmillan, who nodded, giving its approval from the back. Then Malding breathed a sigh of relief. The speech had been a good one, and now every English person knew what was at stake in Cornwall without explicitly being told. Once more, we rally at England's call. Ah, oh, very good. Let's go ahead and come up here. Can we change any of this? Base is at, we're at the base, and this one, 64.3. Base is 65. Actually, it's already going up, so we probably want to increase efficiency, probably. What does this one do? Uh, loyalty will mildly increase. Uh, okay. So now, we're at 70%. Next month it'll drop. What if we kept doing more loyalty? There we go. Now we maximize that out. So it's currently 81%. The base loyalty is 75%. It is what it is, but that's not bad for government stability. I kind of like that for government stability, actually. State of the English military, not terrible. Just not good. Macmillan supremacy. Look at that government stability. That's really nice. Oh! House of Commons. I forgot about this. Oh, UE Macmillanists, the libs. And an RP. Oh, because we'll have more elections here later on. Oh, no. NF. What is that? National Front? What is, what's the National Front? Oh. Probably that National Front. Yes, Chesterton. RP's Royal Party? Sorry, Maggie. Not here. Oh, oh, that's what she gives you. That's Government Stability Factor. Oh, no. What did they call Power Game? They're ma oh, no one likes Edward VIII. Ooh. And then we have... Oh, look at this guy. Government Stability Factor. Daily Political Power. Unemployment Rate. Macmillan's Influence. Nice. Electoral Map. That was... Not great, but it's okay. It, is, it, is, it was what it was. It was what it is. Was. Words are hard, you know. Very good. And let's go ahead and read. Ruin the supplies. Intelligence reports from the war show the rebels The rebels oftentimes infiltrate the garrison territory to conduct sabotage and assassination missions against the troops there. These reports detail tactics, operations, and infiltration methods to do these missions. And a lot of these reports were never shown to our gallant allies in the garrison. Let's pick up where the rebels left off. Destroying war warehouses, sabotaging fuel tanks, even robbing railroad cars will deprive the Germans of the necessary materials to wage war against us. We may not be able to do anything as spectacular as burn Plymouth off the face of the earth, but... A long campaign of attrition will hurt the same garrison just as well. Or, hurt the garrison just the same. Alright everyone, so I went ahead and actually did the one for liberal support that gave us a little bit more influence with military loyalty. So now it's 89.6%, the base loyalty is 80%, so uh, maybe I shouldn't have spent the PP then, but it is what it is. And as you can see, we got a little more government stability, and we just ruined their supplies, which is very, very nice. Let's go ahead and strike their heart. For the longest time, the garrisons contributed immensely to the suffering of the English people. Their forces have kept the island under threat for years. They have run a piece of English territory like an Eastern Reich's Commissariat, punishing the good people who live there. And they have stifled any hope that England of old could be made again. Now, they collect the reward for their services. We're gaining our freedom. Ooh. Oh, we might as well read this one just because I don't get this one done. But the entire formation in Cornwall was eliminated, destroyed the, by the people, and the military was exposed to threaten and coerce. One of the most feared forces of the Hare, led by its most famed generals, is now completely destroyed, and England is no longer threatened by any immediate threat on the Isles. The world has been shown that England must be taken seriously. Its forces can defeat the Germans in open battle once again, and has sev severed all of its old chains and bonds with the pact. We stand as a country born and a nation that is going to assert its freedom against all comers, and that opens some doors that we once believed were tightly shut. So in the meantime, let's go and stop training. We go and need some organization for this. We should do pretty darn well since we did turn all these divisions except for like one into uh, okayish infantry divisions, which are obviously not really great right now. With the pistol held, England's hot. Let's well, see what happens. A few miles from Bristol lies a fence of barbed wire. Beyond that is the greatest threat to England's independence and prosperity, an area that guarantees that we are no safer than we were in the first few days of sea line, and a land by by all rights, political and cultural and geographic, should belong to England, but does not this. Is Cornwall. Cornwall itself isn't a threat. It only has a few divisions of German troops, most of whom are well trained, but small in number. In a wider context, it is terrifying. In an emergency, the Germans can move a large number of troops into Plymouth, and we will be dealing with an army group on English soil when the war begins. If we're to keep our country safe, we must eliminate Cornwall's garrison. If we're to exercise control over the whole of England, we must eliminate Cornwall. But it would be unwise to strike first without considering how Germany would respond. Germany might very well send troops to back up Cornwall and start a war with us. Or they may be more open to negotiate withdrawal in exchange for certain concessions, whatever the case. We're going to be rid of the Cornwall garrison and finally be free once and for all. Let's see who we're dealing with. Maybe give it a day or two and see what happens. Um, not bad. An Ingle in Germania. 
Hermann Göring strapped in Germania, or German, has quickly become unsettling news for the people of England. Some reports, which have been limited in number, have already started to spread. They outline his ambitions to reassert the Reich's hegemony over Europe, and possibly reach further still into the wider world. The German army now circles over England, waiting for its chance to dive down and clutch its prey. Its independence has never been more threatened, except, of course, for the days of the last German invasion and occupation. Many within the government have begun to watch the Cornwall garrison with increasingly wary eyes, eyes which have already seen the horrors these soldiers have already committed and will no doubt repeat given the chance. They no doubt will do all they can to prevent this. They would rather die than endure such anguish again. All of England knows that the German eagle is ready to sink its talons into them the moment it gets its opportunity. And with so much that could be lost, there's no action that would be left off the table. A better battle may yet still be fought. Let us prepare to clip their wings. Let's see what happens. Actually, how's the budget doing? Uh, I usually like cutting down the deck because you only get half of the amount of deficit you get for GDP, which is still not bad, but still. Drawing up a plan, the phone on Bernard Montgomery's desk sprung into life, ringing shrilly at him until he leant over to pick up the darn receiver. He was surprised to hear that the call had come from number 10, and was even more so when he heard his instructions uh, coming directly from the Prime Minister. The request was, however, clear, and it it was a request that was readily accepted by Montgomery. As chief of staff, Montgomery was expected to be the one who would draw plans for an invasion of the Cornwall garrison. The operation would have to be swift, calculated, and without even the slightest risk of failure. If these points were neglected, the repercussions on the English government and its people would be immense. Germany would show even less restraint than it did before. England would be left as nothing more than a husk of its already hollowed self. Yet despite being fully aware, aware of this, Montgomery's reply to the Prime Minister was a calm and a brief. When the time comes, we will be ready. Let's go ahead and do dinner with him. Loyalty will moderately increase. More influence. Political power is not bad. Here we go again. Uh, you know what? That's probably really good to do. But business from afar. Oh, yeah. Let's do that one first. Ah, the matter of trade in better times than the days of the UK. England stood above all others in the global markets. Chinese porcelain, Kenyan ivory, and the teas of India alike flowed through our ports because of their owners. They knew they would get no better prices elsewhere. Those days are gone, and our trade in the modern era is a matter of choice and political necessity. Rather than a taken for granted luxury, we might be tempted to remain neutral, grab as many bargains as we can, and keep the money flowing to rebuild our rubbled streets. Or we might choose to take a side, delve deeper into the arms of Wall Street in return for a closer linking of our own fortunes and those of the Americans. We cannot do both, for no matter how much we might give might be tempted to, it is time for a government to choose. Well, we'll see what happens. Choose well, choose wrongly, choose you know. What happens happens. Montgomery's plan. In the early hours of the morning, Bernard uh, Montgomery arrived at number 10, with his hurriedly drafted plans tucked under an arm. He did not have to wait long before he was directed into the PM's room to give his outline of how the operation would unfold. First, he declared England would need the support of the OFM. Without it, the plan would surely fail and would not, even he would not go oh, allowed to go ahead. Next. The military will still need to strike quickly. Limiting casualties will not be uh, limitless. Limiting casualties will not be an available option. Speed and overwhelming power being all the advantages the English army has over the garrison. Finally, Montgomery concluded that the assault should begin at the soonest possible convenience, lest the enemy were somehow to uncover the plan. His methods may not have been entirely what Harold Macmillan was hoping for, but they understood that there was no other choice. England would have to be would have to strike hard or not strike at all. Is this a risk we're willing to take? I don't know about them, but that's the risk we're willing to take here. Well, that's not still not too bad. I still want to get raise this up even higher and higher. I wonder if... Oh, it seems kind of bad to do it. I'm sorry about my creaky desk, but... Mm, reduce unemployment. Ooh. Cities. Isn't there one that usually just helps unemployment or poverty? Wow, minus 15%. Holy crud, that's a lot. Yeah, here's this one. 75 is quite a bit. Ooh. It looks like we might be able to get stability up to 90. I might want to wait just a little bit more, maybe, first. This is from afar. Over the Atlantic. Battle for Italy is nice. Um, every own state. We want to maintain trade with one... Trade mainly with one faction, not here or there. Oh, so you can't do this one because Herman Goring is fear. Oh, that sucks. Requesting American support. Constructing a request for American support was a much harder task than many number 10 had been willing to admit. It had turned out that it was hard to word their appeal as a simple request instead of a plea for help. Yet the seriousness of the situation remained and hung over the heads of everyone present. Vital minutes passed, which fast approached hours, tempers soar, and voices were raised more than once. The Prime Minister tried their best to remain above it all, but at times it was almost impossible. Much to everyone's dismay, the drafting drifted later and later into the day. And yet after more arguing, the correct phasing was found, phrasing was found and the request was immediately sent out to Washington. There was little wonder as to why there was so much bickering. The very future of England depends entirely on what the response the Americans gave. Our dearest friends from across the Atlantic. So if we're doing this one, I would love to do this one. Unlimited trade, that seems like really great stuff. Focus on tourism. Uh, invite big banks. Entice foreign investments as the Switzerland of the Isles. 
but it looks like we're going to be forced on over the Atlantic. 20 years ago, the forces of the Reichel invaded our nation, sundered its parts, and brought such ruination upon our people that we have not recovered even decades after the fact. England cannot survive in a position <clears throat> uh, of neutrality. We cannot expect the Germans to continue sitting on their heels forever whilst our nation prospers just outside its borders. Its borders. The Americans might have failed us once, but they have learned well as anyone the price of failure. The new America is not as foolhardy as it was in the past, but is no less committed to the utter destruction of fascism that it was in the war. We shall approach them, deal with them, and even if we... If we don't get the benefits of neutrality, we will never need again to worry about the Germans pillaging our fair isle. And the liberals get more influence, even though I'd probably prefer to do this one, honestly. But we'll get more liberal influence for now, just because there's nothing we can really do about it. But Montgomery makes a demand. But not Montgomery. Found himself waiting outside the door of Never Ten yet again. However, the circumstances were vastly different to the last time he had arrived at Ten Downing Street. <clears throat> it was much later, and the Prime Minister had not requested his advice. Nevertheless, the increasingly impatient Chief of Staff invited him in and waited to be let into the office of the PM. He made his presence immediately known, bursting into the room and heading straight for Harold Macmillan. I warned you already, if we don't work quickly, this invasion will never work. We can't delay any longer. This is the greatest importance you have to. For out of the corner of the room, some unfortunate soul attempted a protest against Montgomery's proposal. However, they were soon shot down. I don't bloody well care what you think. This invasion needs to begin right bad right now, or else we'll be all back. We blood... Or what... We'll We'll all be back, we bloody started. Or, let's missing where? Where we bloody started. For the first time since ge the general had entered, silence filled the room. Montgomery stepped back out from the prime minister and the room turned to Harold Macmillan. The deadlock would have to be broken. They had to choose whether or not the invasion would be given the green light. We're nowhere near ready? Why not? Business from afar, just business. Our businesses have many opportunities abroad to open up shop and begin bringing in the wealth that we'll need to restore England's economic future and infrastructure. However, our relations have become increasingly strained with our partners on the continent and in America due to the antipathy between our two trading partners. We have two options. Stick with neutrality as long as possible or begin to open up towards either European markets with German support or try to attract American finances. Neutrality would give us the best of both worlds and allow trade relations with both sides, which is why we've been so hesitant to pick a side so far. However, this window is quickly closing and continuing neutrality now might hurt our negotiations later due to our disloyalty to either party. America, though, that great nation, has massive trading power and an unrivaled financial system, but working with America would antagonize our European trading partners, not to mention the national security risk of working with the main opponent of a militarily aggressive neighbor. We could also draw closer to Germany, where there appears to be some economic liberalization taking place. Sure there is. We could take advantage of this new system to slip ourselves into the European sphere and reap the rewards of the markets there. Or should we delay taking a side or look across our shores to international markets? Opportunity waits. We need to look abroad because that's what we're forced to do. But it's fine. Mm -hmm. I just want to help out poverty people. Poverty man. Uh, 10 more support. Ah, just do it anyway. Screw it. It says it it's, took a 75. Do we have enough of that? No, look at that. 90, wow. Base, can we get the base a little bit higher? Efficiency will go up. There we go, 90%. That's pretty good. Okay, I think that is pretty darn decent. 90%. There's not two reasons why. The or their orders were revival, the day was still dark. They were to attack immediately, striking deep into the territory the German garrison occupied, eliminating all resistance as they went. There would be no further delay. They would recapture Cornwall quickly, or they would no doubt die in the ensuing bloodbath. Each of them eyed each other warily. They knew other gaps in their lines of soldiers' vulnerabilities as well as the sheer resistance they would have to face. They could certainly not be sure of their support superiors. had taken every necessary precaution and insecurity that was felt by many Westminster as well. They not fully prepared. Most of the nation's soldiers had not arrived at the border, yet alone been briefed with their objectives. Some of the ministers who had been pr present at number 10, when the green light was had been given, felt as if they had failed, allowing the PM to take such reckless actions. Yet whether you were a politician in Westminster or a soldier on the front, there was very little you could do now apart from keep calm, carry on, and pray silently, or silently pray that you would make it through. God save England. What do you mean? We're ready to go. Our guys are half strength. <laughs> We're ready to go, man. What do you mean? Invite American companies? Sure, why not? If an, ever a nation embodied uh, capitalism to its fullest extent, that would be the United States of America. This is useful for us, as it means we have a simple and straightforward way of getting to their proverbial hearts, namely presenting the companies with the opportunity to make so much money that their rebellious ancestors will turn in their graves. We will lower tariffs and taxation on, on American companies and goods, which besides making their lobbyists influence government quite happy, also has a benefit of ensuring that we will not be the ones shouldering all the expenses of building new industry. Our people will like the new and shiny American companies with their strange goods, as it well, no doubt. Everybody wins. Nice. Invite American companies. 
over the Atlantic, my friends. So we can't do that, and we can't do that up there, so we're kind of stuck with what we're doing down here, or over here. Uh, I did it with Monty, how about that? But Odd Montgomery is one of the few men still alive who knows exactly why it was that the UK agreed to its own dismantlement. He was with Macmillan when the treaty was negotiated, and among the most fervent voices for maintaining the peace at all costs. His subsequent victory over the insurgent Himmler has only made him more useful to the future of England, and perhaps it is time he be brought more directly on board with that future. A meeting is required, and a reasonably private one at that. We can reach out to one of his stepsons to arrange it and broach the possible subjects, namely the prevention of any future Operation Sea Lion. Oh, there goes those guys. Montgomery will likely be interested. He's quite the reasonable man after all. We just need to give him the right incentive. We got a lot of peepee. This is still going down. We definitely need to... Uh, actually, you know what? Let's increase this first. Um, if it's already... If it's uh, 90 base, 90%. If we do this, it says military loyalty will decrease. How low will it go? It will go below 90%. Oh, it does go below... Oh, that's bad, bad, bad. I should not click that. Just because I wanted to get this a little higher. Next month, the efficiency of our command will be 52.6.5%. Why is it... Why is it... Go, this, why is it go, I wanted to get rid of the, the, the deficit of attack and defense here, but... Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit more support for liberals, which is fine. Oh, corn... Oh. Invade. Prepare. Um, we need more guns, then. Oh, good boy. Oh, that's just not good. Screw the arty. We need more guns for now. Or we just invade. Remove the spoker... Oh... We can still win, maybe. I mean, our soldiers look like they're pretty much prepared and ready to go, so... Well, why not? Move on in, boys. See what you can do. Military construction is very nice. Boom, 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 boom. Engineering should be pretty good. Radar, uh, I guess we can get that one, too. It doesn't really matter too much. We beat up some Germans. How many men have we lost in this battle thus far? We should not have cut down our military expenses. I have up to five divisions. Find them and kill them all. Please, keep, everyone keep moving. Please, everyone keep moving. Oh, they're definitely trying to attack. 2,000. Keep both of you attacking that same position. Alright, we've killed off. Not enough Germans. Fighting the next war. The food is excellent, Chairman. I must compliment your chef, said Bernard Montgomery, as he sliced off a portion of the risotto that had been prepared for him by Macmillan's household staff. It was an excellent affair, meaning for a special occasion, meant for a special occasion. And that led the field marshal to understand that this was hardly a social call. For his part, the Chairman had hardly touched his meal, staring absently out the window to the bustling streets of metropolitan London beyond. Chairman, Montgomery gently prompted. Yes, the food is, is, uh, said McMillan, began after lazily snapping to attention and then chilling off with his disinterest at the topic. Marshal, you have a reputation for planning, over planning some would say. What guides your plan since the rebel rebels surrendered? So then, it seemed, Bernard's dinner companion had largely called him here for consultation. It was a duty he'd gladly performed without the misdirection. Well, the Civil War has changed the status quo quite significantly, he said. Before eating another bite of steak and allowed himself to swallow, the traitors played their hand and have naturally been eliminated. Even so, Englishmen have found the new things to squabble over, and now that the compatriots have shed each other's blood in this generation, the gates are open, the taboo is lifted, and it may happen again. Your plan for the next war? asked Macmillan in surprise. Always. Good, replied the chairman, smiling conspiratorially. Now perhaps you and I should speak of our mutual friend Chesterton and in his black shirts. You see, I too have been planning for the next war, Marshal. There will always be a next war, because we love war. We love it, love it, love it. Okay, let's grab... Ooh, actually... Open up offices in America. We love America. The English corporate sector might be a shadow of its former self, but our corporations are some of the oldest and most respected in the world. Our ties with the Americans have involved many of their investors coming here for business, so why should we not take the opportunity and see if the Americans want some tried and tested English products? Given giving our businesses some new markets cannot hurt, as indeed we will might see a few runaway successes if we're lucky. On the down low, this opportunity will help us mollify some of our more influential businessmen once affiliated with the royal party. A new patron might seem useful to let to those left out in the wings of change. In the winds of change. Not wings, but winds. Close enough, you know. Alright, so what was up here? What was this? It's going to drop. Oh, 100%. Loyalty. Um, hmm. That seems like it's dropping quite a bit too much. Promote competent officers. Efficiency will drop. And, I mean, that's pretty good already. Alright. What else? Protect this. Oh, yes, this stuff. What about poverty, which sucks? But then we're going to immediately go and grab this one as well. Regaining our freedom to get more stability. Undermining the Reich. We could probably do that. Yes, we will do that. Reaching out to friends. We can do both of these. That's very nice. Oh, very good. McDonald's? <laughs> oh, that'll be a good one to do. 
And let's go ahead and do that one. Jumps. Yes. I wanted 90%, but you know, it is what it is. Ah, oh, that sucks. Actually, if we get enough, ooh, open up offices. And then I've already read this one, but if you want to read it again, please go right ahead. But there we go. Victory, victory lap. Cleaning up the old potty. No. Oh, there goes military loyalty, but we don't have enough PP for that. We only get two a day. Come on. 2.29. That's not enough. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, and Sukarno wins the Indonesian Civil War. After this one, undermining the Reich. Let's do that first. Just in case. For far too long, England has been a slave to Germany as a puppet. Forced to endure poverty, humiliation, and hardship. And all for the benefit of a few stuck-up barbarians who think a shaky linguistic interpretation of Sanskrit makes them a world-conquering master race. Well, their dom dominion over the English Isles is at an end. Now we begin to take moves that will free us from the bonds with a Hun. Nice. Just so we have better trade relations with them. Just in case. You never know what the Germans might be up to. Oh, okay, never mind. Victory lap. Okay, cool. This all... Oh, so if you want to read about this one, please go right ahead. Or this one, clicking, clicking in the Reich, becoming our own. An arms deal. Distancing ourselves from Germany. Visiting the Overlord. A false friendship, as well as... But a profitable one. Cool, that... All got done. Okay. And as much as we do McDonald's, we gotta do consult the generals. The English army has now been divided into two distinct doctrinal camps, both of which insist their strategy is the best to defend England and is the best way to defend... A to prevent a German incursion. As always, we can really only re support one. One faction of the armed forces insists a strategy of intense fortification is a way to fend off an invasion. By wearing the Germans down, they say we would make the cost of an attack on England too much for the Reich. This is folly, say the others. England alone cannot withstand the invasion. We must seek aid from the OFN instead and get their help in our defense. Many have reservations about working with the ones who supported the rebels just a short time ago, but others say we do not have a matter in the choice. A victory lap. Soon after the announcement that came from the situation in Plymouth had been resolved in England's favor, Prime Minister Maudling and Macmillan decided to take a quick stroll to the Guards Memorial to pay their respects. It was only fitting, they thought, to pay homage to those who had died keeping the country free now that the last passion of German occupation had been eliminated. As I walked down past the statue of Robert Clive between that foreign office and the Revenue of and Customs building, a few Londoners who were walking past were astonished to see the Prime Minister walking by with a few police escorting them. They were equally astonished when he told them Cornwall's English once again. Modeling was surprised by the subdued initial reaction, but Macmillan assured them that the people who heard Lloyd George announcing from his window the Great War would end in a few hours probably were confused as well. Once again, Macmillan's instincts proved correct, for when they arrived at the memorial, people had begun to hear about it. Bicycle commuters stopped to shake the PM's hand and tell him, job well done. Even the police officers who are, who are on patrol in the, of the park left their routes to congratulate modeling. As they walked back, a small entourage formed, cheering modeling on, singing patriotic songs, and making rude mark remarks about the Germans and occasionally the head of the shadow government, or shadow cabinet. When they made it back to number 10, a crowd was already waiting for them, and so were and so were plenty for us. As they went inside, modeling waved to the cheering crowd that was ever-growing, while Macmillan rebuffed the media's questions by saying that they could expect a complete address from the PM shortly. Both men were later told by Scotland Yard not to do something so risky again. The crowds grew too large too fast, but that risk had been accounted for by both the PM and his loyal assistant, and they felt this moment of triumph had been richly deserved. Once more, we rally at England's call. And now, we are not done with the UK. Actually, no, th th they're not first. We have to deal with the little uh, rebellious folk to our west. I wonder, if I click on this, will loyalty jump up back to 90%? Ooh, it's 89%. No, I probably won't. We could try it, though. This is all just experimentation for later, I guess, so whatever. Uh, there you go. And it's going to jump up to 80. Okay, 85. That's not bad. 85. I can take that. It wasn't 90, but 85 is not bad. We'll go to 85. Even though it's already 99%, but whatever. Consult the generals because that's going to be super important. Uh, we can't do that one because we didn't... Because this one makes more sense when we wanted to democratize and liberalize more, but never another sea lion. The most shameful moment in the history of Britain came in 43, when the first Falschemjäger boots touched English soil near Brighton. What came next were years of destruction, humiliation, shame, slavery, and death. We now know the consequences of defeat, and not a man in England will stand for such a disaster again. England held off invaders for 866 years before Sea Lion. We resolved to do much better than that this time around. But the difference of opinion. With all due respect, I think we're going about this all wrong, sir, said General Joffrey Baker. We've been thinking about how we're going to prepare for this, and we keep coming to the realization that it is an enormous task, one that won't be able to do on our own. I think we should consider an alternative route. This caught the attention of the other generals. They've been pretty unanimous at this meeting up until this point. Macmillan was interested as well, asking, so what are you proposing, General? As much as it pains me to say this, he said, we need to get the Americans to help us out with their defense. 
This took the room by surprise. You're out of line, General said Field Marshal Montgomery. The Americans were fighting Auchinleck and the rest of Himmler. They aren't going to help us out, and even if they did, the help they will have to travel all the way from North America over here. No, the only way we can guarantee our defense is to concentrate on making sure we can stand up to Germany. Sir, your disdain for the Americans is well noted, however. They have technologies, equipment, and experience that we need to fight a war against Germany. And they aren't idiotic so much. They know we aren't on good terms with the Germans right now, and they'll support our efforts to keep them off the aisle. It'll be a fair weather of support, Scott Monty, and all the American technology won't replace British defenses and factories. The war is coming, we need to have fortifications and defenses ready. The war is coming, Field Marshal responded Baker, and we need all the outside help we can get. So this is why someone said in the comments we should go with Monty's plan. We'll stand on our own feet or not at all. Another, never another sea lion, my friends. Alright, so we did that one. I do want to raise more efficiency a little bit more, but we're kind of okay with keeping it where it is at for now. Uh, civvies are nice. Uh, it's okay. It's all okay. Uh, yeah, we got to save up money for reduced unemployment. Actually, how is the debt? It's slowly going down. Minus 1.7 billion? Ah, I love jobs. Having one, though, it's nice to get paid. Working? I don't know about that. <laughs> Lessons from 43, not bad. But I want to do uh, the one with McDonald's after we improve our uh, spending here. Or keep it where it was at before. I love McDonald's. Oftentimes, the gastronomical habits of the Yankees is something to be abhorred. The concept of getting a complete meal in only a few minutes with hardly any nutritional value whatsoever isn't something that would seem appealing to English sensibilities yet. The concept of fast food has shown enormous success outside of the U.S. and formerly British countries like Canada, Australia, and Scotland. These restaurants believe that a unique concept of franchising and cheap, readily available meals can work in England as well. This investment will provide plenty of low-level service jobs to the population and allow English children to get a toy with every meal, so why not allow the Americans to try it out? We love the toys from McDonald's. <laughs> I love this, this focus. I love it so much. It's so good. But our solemn vow. When I was in charge of the housing program in 1957, I had the honor of presiding over the opening of a housing complex in Folkestone, near Dover. Folkestone was near the German landing zones and as such it had taken the worst of the invasion. Many homes were destroyed either by shelling or aerial bombardment years after the invasion. One could still see the burnt buildings as shell holes in the exteriors pockmarked with bullet holes. It has been a considerable time since those days and last week I decided to visit the town myself and to see how they were getting on. There had been considerable trouble in the area recently but this did not obscure the scars of war still underneath the surface. Buildings were still burnt, the holes were still in the ground and there were still bullets embedded in the walls of Folkestone. Outside of the city on my way to Dover I saw a group of workers on the beach. A German bomb had been uncovered, I was told, and they were trying to dispose of it. As I watched them work, my gaze was drawn across the ocean. There was Calais, now under perpetual occupation by Herr Himmler's daddy's SS, and at that time I realized two fundamental truths. The invasion was an abuse that England will never forget, yet the chance of another one, possibly worse, was still high. Every once in a while, I've heard people say that England is on the way out, that we are no longer capable of standing up ourselves. Nonsense. This is a great country, one that has a superb record of achievement of every kind. We have no need to fear temporary setbacks. Britain was great, and it can be great, provided we close ranks and stand together never again. But jobs. Jobs, you do say. Yes, we do say jobs, jobs, jobs. J-O-B-S. That's usually how you spell jobs, even though I could be wrong about that. There you go. Get like, oh, oh, we can't build jobs in Cornwall. Oh, that sucks. No, nothing in Cornwall. There you go. Get some infrastructure. And then all three shall support you with some of that good stuff as well. Remember the dangers of fascism? Yeah, we probably will remember that. I'm kind of ping-ponging back between this stuff. Oh, there goes Denmark. Oh, that is not good. An agreement with Iceland? Military factory. Oh, I like this one. Over the Pacific. The Americans might be far and away the most powerful of the offend nations, but they are not the only ones with a loud voice, nor even the only ones that speak English. Australia and New Zealand, our wayward former subjects, are also proud and valiant members of the OFM. It might seem unnecessary to concern ourselves with their going-ons, but making up for past mistakes in regards to the current position, and indeed, in the case of Australia, its decision to become a republic as a task rather better done sooner rather than later. Perhaps it might not hurt to open up a cons consultant consulate, or two as well, maybe even a cultural mission to prove that we've changed from what we were. Perhaps we will rekindle the friendship of our nations what we, that we once shared. Cutting down that debt feels very, very good. All right, anything else here? Oh, I don't mind doing that one. That's 100 political power, though. We could do that, but... Mm -hmm. Military loyalty, we can kind of wait for that one, too. Uh, I don't want to risk that one, either. I don't know. I don't want to spend PP. don't really want to spend it. Current efficiency. Uh, let's wait for it to get a little higher before we do that one, actually. Oh, wait. The base of... Wait. The base loyalty of our high command is 100%. So we're done with that one. Okay. I'm okay with that. I hope you guys are good, okay with that, because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about that one. Base bleed. I love base bleed. Actually, engineers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And then let's go ahead and do lessons from 1943 because we need that. Uh, Attack and defense. Oh no, just attack and core territory and coastal fort construction. The largest navy in the world, an air force backed by advanced radar and spitfires, a massive army using everything at its disposal, multiple lines of permanent fortifications, and the Germans still won. For years, a victimized island is asked why. Well, we'll figure out why. We're going to get a team together to look at through all the documentation of what happened in those fateful months from British and German sources. We'll figure out what went wrong, where those weak lines were. They won't be there next time. That's for darn sure. Because we can either do a smaller force, but better, a smaller but better force, which doesn't look too bad, actually. But you do lose, you get advanced training methods, but you go down from one year draft to volunteer only. Oh, that looks so bad. Oh. Or you get more manpower, and you get more loyalty. I do like the attack. 5% though, 5% more attack and defense. Is that worth it? Is that really worth it? Mm, we're going to wait for that to increase for now. We can kind of ignore that. And jobs. Thank you. Um, actually, can we do anything over here? Reaching out to the old friends? Oh, if an influence will increase. That'll be good. Uh, we might be able to get something... Be a part of them? Ooh. Not dealing with unification. Ooh, Macmillan of Canada. Oh, influence is okay. We could probably actually join them, maybe? Our GB growth will increase. Yeah, support will increase for our guys. That'll be good for elections. I'm not sure when the elections are. That would be really good. Uh, I think we've just got to do this one first. Oh, oh. I mean, I already cut down, uh, we, you know, military numbers already. Ooh. I want to do a smaller but more effective force. Just because you get more daily political power, division training time, recovery rate, attack and defense. Advanced training so you get even more, you get a lot more attack and defense. That's pretty good. Armed professionalism goes up, but we lose population. That's the worst thing. We get more organization, which is actually pretty good as well, so. The army won't like it, but it's really the truth. We shouldn't put our efforts into making a massive and bloated defense force we made up of every man in England, rather. We should put our efforts towards making sure our military is as trained and equipped as possible. Our goal isn't to match the Huns on a manpower basis, but it's to surpass them on a man-to-man -man basis. If our soldiers know what they're doing and they have tools to do it, well, it'll make them as effective as a force ten times their number. And having a massive amount of fortifications to rely on will help them tremendously as well. Not a bad idea. Not a great idea, but not a bad idea. How are we 37 minutes in this video already? What the heck? You know you enjoy a video when you don't even realize how how much time has gone on. Like seriously, like I don't, for real. He's like, <laughs> I can't believe we're this far in the video already. Wow. Man, why does time have to fly when you're enjoying stuff? Report on the failings of British defenses in 1943. Abstract. Uh, I'll save her PP. At the request of the Prime Minister, we've been tasked with conducting an investigation into the failings of the British military during the 43 invasion. This commission, led by General Carver, enlisted the support of the Public Record Office, the Historical Records Commission, and the MRA, or RMA, Sandhurst. After much study, several critical failings have been reported by the commission. One. In the crucial initial hours of the invasion, there was a massive organizational breakdown with many home guard units being overwhelmed and unable to provide an effective defense. Manpower has been stretched thin and what few units there were on a coastal defense were unable to stand the ground, so maybe we should actually get more manpower. British defense fortifications were inadequate and lackluster. A few blockhouses were in place, but they were scarcely enough to hold the enemy back and provide our forces with meaningful cover. A lack of fortified positions meant English forces had few places to hold and launch counterattacks from. 3. The Royal Air Force was unable to provide a degree of aerial protection from against Luftwaffe. The organization was unable to keep up with the German aircraft production or pilot training. Other ways of mitigating this advantage were not available, leading to effective German ground support and attacks against infrastructure. We have not concluded in this report as much analysis of naval failings as those have been well documented elsewhere. This report is primarily for strategic and tactical problems with the Army and the RAF. We will say, however, that, that a lack of intelligence and early warning systems played in, a part in the battle, especially in regards to the German deception in Operation Harbstreis. Time to stop repeating the past. Very cool. Maybe we should stop cutting down the budget for the military, but oh well. Now we have strategic redoubts, which will give us what? More division speed and entrenchment speed. 100% is not bad, but uh, that's okay. Military efficiency will go up and get double bonus for land reduction, which we, we should do, or defend every piece of land. Which I kind of prefer that one just because um, you get more division defense on core territory, which is great for the coast, and more max entrenchment, so I like that one a lot. And you still get a bonus for land reduction. Let us make it clear to the Germans that this is not the 40s, and we're not some Eastern European agrarian backwater. This is England, where we stand ready to defend our land and have the capabilities to back it up. Every school child can recall our centuries of military triumphs, and we can intend to wipe away the shame of 43 with the blood of Nazi Fallschirmjägers and infantrymen. Every beach will have a pillbox. Every field will be guarded by a machine gun nest. Every street will have an AT emplacement at the end of it. Every home will have a squadron, and every barn will have a sniper and the hayloft. And... 
Any advance will take a heavy toll, and we'll see how many lives the Germans will now spend to take our island again. Because they're taking out the Netherlands as well, which is not very good. Ah, jobs, jobs, jobs. So, I'm not sure we can do this in yet. So, just in case, I'm just going to go ahead and do this, maybe. There you go. Do all the areas around here. We're probably going to need a lot of divisions for this, but it is what it is, you know. Why does England have to have so much coastline? You know, they probably asked the same thing, too, when uh, they were invaded by the Vikings, you know, over a thousand years ago, so. Why is there so much coast to defend? Oh, there goes the Netherlands. Nice. And Italy joined the co-prosperity sphere. They like doing that a whole lot now in my games. It's very, very weird. Oh, look at 72.5. Heavy lay the crown. Uh-oh. The crackling voice came over the radio, just like in the Warriors. But this is an old man's voice, one tired of great responsibility and uncertainty. A man who is tired of being called a collaborator in the streets, of having his name cursed by the population he has ostensibly served, and of being unsure whether his palace was a gift or a prison. For many long years now, I presided over England as your king. I cannot always say that has been a joyful task. One feels many hardships when one country is under great strain. While I've had many doubts about my own feelings in this position over many years, I have never lost faith in the English people. Their spirit and outlook towards the future will come what may, has uplifted all of England to what it is today. In these changing times, one needs an upturned face and a stiff upper lip. I therefore say with heavy heart that I must discharge my duties as king, and have done so so several hours ago. I firmly believe that I cannot offer England what she needs any longer, and that her people require more from me than I can deliver. What is needed now is a voice for strange and unknown times, a heart without fear and doubts. I believe that my successor will provide this. And he has my full loyalty and support. And so we shall all have a new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all, and God save the king. God save the king. Goodbye, King Edward VIII. And simulate an invasion. Yeah, I want to. I kind of want to maximize this out just for now, just because you never know what's going to happen, man. Simulate an invasion. Unfortunately, we are unable to enlist the help of the Valmacht in doing an inversion of their invasion to test our defenses. Fortunately, we can do the next best thing. With the knowledge of German tactics and good estimates of their numbers, we can simulate their invasion in an exercise. Computers will help control for variability and other effects. The aim of this war or game is to test our strategies against an actual invasion. We will see any major flaws in our strategy so we can correct them. Any successes will be noticed, noted as well, especially ones that we did not expect. With a pretend invasion, we will be much more ready for the real thing. Which is very, very good. It's always, very, always, always good to plan. Always incredibly good to plan. Um, then again, sometimes I should take my own advice. Uh, nothing I mean, we could do with that, but... Um, we'll do it once, why not? I'm not sure what we'll get, but Monarchy Reborn. King Henry the Ninth, the first Henry since 1547, now sits upon the throne of England. God save the king. Given his current state, he might need saving rather soon. While Henry has always had poor health and should be expected from a strapping young English lad, age has certainly not been kind to him. At over 60 at the time of his unexpected coronation, he now has to deal with a changing nation and a changing political situation. Nevertheless, his crowning was subject to the usual celebration and fanfare. All the better for a nation still disunited and struggling to recover from a vicious civil war. Perhaps this man will be the one to unite the people behind the government again. Or perhaps he will be unable to bear the burdens of the body and mind that the English people require him to. The king is gone. Long live the king. Oh, artillery will be great for invasion stuff. Land auction. Oh, we already got a lot of it done. Nice. Ah, oh, we already did it. Planning. Great. We did some of it. Oh, we're looking here. Oh, things are going up. Slightly. A little bit. Two... Um, I just don't know when they're going to attack. Okay, so, uh, you know what, we're not going to cut military spending down for now, because we because uh, we do that, it hurts our output, and we do need some more output right now. Oh, we have more than enough guns, holy crud. Okay, so we can get rid of some of those guns, there you go. Um, actually, at this point, I'm going to keep doing that one thing that gets it's a military or civilian factory for free, so I think that'll be good to do. Um, if we run out of things to do here... We're going to build up so many coastal forts. God dang it, I knew that was going to happen. Man, why does Port want to be so small? It's so small. A pillbox literally all over the coast. Oh, is that Gloucestershire? Gloucestershire? I don't know how to say that. I'm not too English, but I am. A little bit, maybe. Um, yeah, huh. I should really go to the UK someday, but eh, right now, probably not. Someday. There you go. Radar, we already have good radar here. Anyways, eh, we'll get some more later on, too. Simulate an invasion, though. A new Royal Navy? Not bad. Uh, blow up the Panzers. Anti-tank. Oh, oh, we got to get some already? Okay. Blow up the Panzers. Germany's strength is in their mechanized beasts. They storm across Europe, sowing death and destruction wherever they want. Our home guard is scarcely in the defense except jamming logs into their tracks and trying to pour sugar in the gas tanks. 
This was ineffective, and in many cases suicidal. To make it even worse, the new versions of the Panzers are even more armored, better armored, and better armed and larger than any model we face in the invasion. But instead of immobilizing, what if we destroy them instead? It certainly is a concept worth putting effort into. Peace and boom brought to Vietnam. Good good for Vietnam. Very good for them. Minus one billion. Sounds good to me. Fortify the coast immediately, though. Knowing where your enemy is coming from is an incalculable advantage in a fight, and we know where the Germans are coming from. They're coming across the sea. This is the broad front, sure, but in the means, we can concentrate our efforts in defending a few critical areas and ports to prevent the enemy from sustaining a foothold. A series of barbed wire, landmines, and just plain fortifications are to be built across the coastline. These will offer our soldiers defendable positions to dig into and protection against enemy. Fire. Support. Sure. It sort of ruins the scenery, but we won't be able to enjoy England at all if it's under the jackboot. Conclusions of the Sanders Exercise. Oh, oh, we had great for that one first. In summary, the war game ended in English victory by a vote of 6-0 from the umpires. Oh, the Germans were limited in the areas they could invade without access to the French coast, and were forced to conduct operations on the eastern shore of England. The English team had expected this, and were able to deploy their units in the area. This ended up giving the crucial advantage, giving them the crucial advantage, as they were able to hold on to the ports and prevent the Germans from gaining them. Without an avenue for resupply, the German beachheads were pushed back into the sea with a great loss of men and material. They were, however, some difficulties for the English that should not be discounted. Ooh, no. German armor provided a level of hardness to the invasion that was difficult to overcome. It was responsible for most of Germany's early gains in the exercise. England was unable to counter these tanks and oftentimes lost engagements to them. Only the lack of supply eventually allowed England to defeat the Panzer divisions. Two. Or Zwei. Germany started the exercise with air superiority and maintained it throughout the game. This made any English operation difficult and was responsible for prolonging the German defense. England lacked the ability to counter this advantage. We'll have to do better for when it is for real. Pretty much. Pretty much. There you go. My goal is to get rid of the debt. Oh, whoa! Whoa! Where did you guys come from? Whoa! Whoa, but daddy, we got 12 combo is not very good. Oh, we'll take a Oh, they even have support attack helicopters. Nice! Oh, you guys are 16 combo with? Oh, yeah. Sign me up, Mr. Krabs. I don't... What? To, uh -huh. Oh! Wait, what? This is... The Americans! Okay! Why not? Also, just do this one, too. Oh, actually, we have military... Uh, cavalry is technically better. Uh, they do have military police on them already. These, these require anti-tank, and I don't want to use anti-tank on them. I'll be honest, like... <sighs> cavalry is technically better. But I don't want to have to use anti-tank. Then again, it saves on manpower, which we don't have. How much anti-tank do we have? Really none! <laughs> so, uh, oh man, that sucks. Actually, oh my gosh, we need so much of everything. Okay, yeah, we definitely gotta do that one McMill Macmillan thing. Fortify the coast, good, good. Better engineers are good. Bueno, bueno, yummy, yummy. Um, It's almost 67, let's grab that one. Improve anti air. We won't have any of that either, probably. Which sucks. But well, let's come over here, shall we? Alright, so we can get more jobs. Where's the one that factory stuff? It's not back yet, is it? No, it's not. So, jobs. So, I I'm worried about Goring. I'll be honest, I'm really worried about Goring, so radars in the southeast. In this fight, we need every advantage that can be seized by us. We can create as many tactical and strategic advantages on England as we could, but there's still more that needs to be done. We must know the enemy and not just be able to match them on paper. A series of radar stations in the southeast served our nation well in the last war, and they'll be expanded in this one. We will see the enemy ships before they ever sight English soil. We will know when a fight of aircraft is coming to attack us well before they arrive over England, and we can listen to the attack units from far away. When they attack, we will know, and we will be able to meet them. Which is very, very good. Look at all that uh, political power we got. Not bad. Alright, is it here yet? Yes, it is. So it's called Meeting the Industrial Giants. And then, so we have 16 military... Oh my gosh, 16. Oh, we got another civvy. Actually, I don't mind civvies. I love the civvies. Don't get me wrong. I love civvies, but still. Keeping the skies clear. Oh, we get a bonus for empty air. We'll never be able to match the Luftwaffe in the air. That's a sad fact, but it's the truth. We lack the aircraft and pilots necessary to stop the enemy from coming over the countryside and attacking from where they want. They still have to come over, and so we can make it hard for them. A series of anti-aircraft batteries, unlike anywhere else in the world, will make any journey over England fraught with danger. Cannons and missiles await at every potential target and over the, every route to, to it. If they want to attack, they will have to face these defenses. If they want to neutralize these batteries, they still need to attack. If they don't attack, they cannot win. But if you want to read about this one, please go ahead. This is kind of generic. I got this when I was playing as America. Support for Switzerland, so... Um, you can read about this if you like to. Uh, let's see. Oh, we can actually... Oh, we can... We get strength and defenses. Oh, 
Um, yeah, I'm gonna add that to us. Yeah, that's that's nice to help them out, but still, I think I'd prefer to help us. We love Switzerland, don't get us wrong. We want to become Switzerland of the Isles, but if we get some more defense on our own territory, I think that's a little better for us. Just saying. Sorry, Switzerland. But honestly, yeah, she might be able to hold out. But we'll see how long. Nice. And one step ahead of them. Because you get ooh, a lot more counter intel. Nice. Something we English have always prided ourselves on is our intelligence system. We place a premium on finding out all we can about our enemies. Today is no different. MI6 must have people everywhere throughout the pact in order to find out what we can about an invasion. Our agents will give us everything we need. They will give us the codes and a rate of frequencies. They will give us the order of battle. They will give us the plans of the invasion force. And they will give us what's most valuable at all. A date. Uh, we can't do this one because... Oh. Oh, it requires this one. Pack with the old fan. Actually, that would be really cool. But, spy, spy on Germany. Two more operative styles. Not bad. Air bases are okay. A British U-2. It's not bad. Not great. American... Oh, that's really good. Army professionalism will rapidly improve. Military efficiency will moderately increase. But keep this guy's clear. is very good as well. Shoot, photo shoot with the police. That's not too bad. Man, they're not going to bring back the one about poverty? Oh, why? 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 Oh, wow. Well, that's not too good. But we're improving ourselves regardless, so that's not too bad, so. And do we need both? Yes, we do. A new Royal Navy. Drake's Defenders of the Grave Lines, Nelson's Heroes of Trafalgar, Jellicoe's Victors of the Jutland, a group of rusted hulks in the estuary. This is what the war occupation has done to our navy. We will rebuild our vessels. We cannot afford a fleet like the one we had when we had empire and a roaring economy. Whatever we can afford, however, we will build. Britain's pride and honor demands it. More importantly, our survival relies upon it. Well, there goes Switzerland. Now, I've had it before in my games where uh, Germany, they attack um, Bulgaria, and but they can't reach Bulgaria, so they get stuck. Clean up. I need to play as Goring sometime. It's, I think there is a sub-mod for Goring. Well, just, to, you know, in general, that disables nukes so you can take out everyone that you really want. So, I think there is. Please correct me if I'm wrong about that, because I, I might want to try that out sometime. Uh, I don't want to do this one. Give us another civvy. We need that civvy right now. Or we don't really need it, but it'd be nice to have. Regardless, submarine warfare. The last time Germany attempted to bridge a massive body of water, it only took years and broke their economy too. It was also less than half the width of the English Channel, and nobody was shooting at them on the opposite side. It's safe to say they'll be ferrying their men across the sea this time, which gives us an advantage. A few British subs in the invasion force will allow us to, to allow us to cause unprecedented amounts of mischief and destruction. We can choke their supply lines or sever them entirely, guaranteeing us a total victory in the land war. Thus, subs will play an integral part in a Royal Navy. Bridge over trouble water. Is there any state less ill-equipped to handle its independence than Wales? A state that exists solely to defend itself from the fascists, and yet the fascists could come in at any moment and kick the entire state down with a swift kick. A tiny military, an economy based on a single resource, and constantly under threat from an infantile man with delusions of grandeur? No wonder the people beg for our help. Wales has to be part of England. If we're to have Great Britain once more, we must have it under our control. They'll ask for some accommodations, and we'll be happy to give it to them. But if they outright reject us, we're prepared to go in and get them the protection they need to survive. Open palm, clench fist. Let's finish a Royal Navy first, and then click on this, because it's going to force us to do those focuses regarding Wales. I wonder what the, when this was going to happen, but it happens, apparently, in 1967. Really close to 1967, so. So now we can't do this, because it's been locked. Whatever. Totally fine. Uh, where's Wales? Wales! Where'd you go? Uh, come over here first. Reduce unemployment's nice. Meet with industrial giants. And now we get what? Another military factory! Good! Great! Jolly good. Now that's not too bad for artillery. That's looking god awful. We're gonna need more APCs where we're headed to as well. So go under there. Go under. Oh, basic arty. Uh, uh, it's kind of okay already. What kind of okay with that? Um, we're gonna need a lot of tanks though. But let's come over here and do the stuff on the far left. Bringing Wales into the fold. The first nation on the Isles to be conquered by the Senate Kingdom of England is in the, in the medieval age. Wales has long detested our supremacy, mounting a strong resistance against us, first through petty kingdoms, kings and rebellions, and then peaceful agitation. Unionist elements in Welsh society still exist, however, and they may be key to peaceful unification. England and Wales will once again be won, this time hopefully without bloodshed. But if there is bloodshed, then sign us up, because we like a little fight in our games. Because if we're not fighting wars in a war game, then what are we really playing? We're playing for the story, that's right. The State of the Royal Navy. Conclusion. 
It's obvious that the Royal Navy is in dire shape and in no way prepared for a modern conflict. On the surface, the Royal Navy comprises a respectable number of vessels more than any other country, many, than many more countries, and backed up by a decent dockyard base. With it. What this hides, however, is an aged navy in no way able to compete with any modern fleet. The major vessels of the Royal Navy are not really impressed with battleship, battleships like the HMS Howell, or relegated to tasks like shore bombardment and are functionally obsolete in naval combat. The pride of the fleet, the HMS Implacable, as a relic of the Second World War, relying on a small fleet of prop-driven aircraft to provide air support. <clears throat> Screening vessels are where the Navy derives most of its strength. Even there, the destroyers are mostly out of date, with a few exceptions. The main armaments, such as torpedoes and cannons, are ancient. The lack of modern anti-aircraft and necessity is also extremely concerning. Most alarmingly, our fleet lacks proper ASW radar and weaponry, making our destroyers next to useless in a potential conflict. Our sub-fleet is small, obsolete, and ineffective, comprising only a few vessels. It has been mothballed since the Second World War and woefully obsolete. Other subs are, better, are better in nearly every respect, and, will so, and so will enemy ASW ships. It is clear an upgrade is in order, and with newer ships with modern armaments needed to be produced. If we wish to keep these ships, they need to be modernized as well. And a complete rebuilding of the fleet air arm must also take place. Only by the massive effort can we hope the Royal Navy to regain some semblance of her former strength, and will put in that effort. Forcing them back in. There's your defenses. Um, I'm not really sure. I like. I would like the PP. I, I hope this goes peacefully. Once again with us. So, we'll have to see what happens. I guess it's just there's nothing we can do. We just gotta wait, so... Actually, screw the way. I want to read another focus first time. Because I want to I want to make sure that we get through this as fast as possible. Oh, yeah, what's up, Warfare? Protect the supply lines. It seems the same story over and over again. Britain and Germany are at war. Britain relies on supply convoys from North America to survive. Germany decides they can win the war quickly and easily by sinking the convoys. They haven't done it before, and we'll make sure that they don't do it this time either. We're not going to just hope they sink another Lusitania or a Reuben James. ASW ships and destroyers will guard the convoys in North America, or the North Atlantic. Our route to the New World will be maintained and never break. We will go toe-to-toe -to -toe the Germany's Kriegsmarine once again and show them they can still can't measure up. The Welsh issue. Harold Macmillan has deemed England able to expand. Wales will soon become its likely next target. The nation's been a mess from the start and will likely have no other option than to join us. After all, they are fully aware of the measures we will be willing to use if they were to dare to defy us. They would be, have to be led by some sort of madman to decline. The time for unification talks with the Welsh are upon us. A letter will be sent to Cardiff immediately to get the process started. What choice do they have? Especially when we have quite a few free American tanks, even though it's costing us our own man, our own money, but that is okay with us. America said, unite or die. And we love America. Uh, actually, I might go with Scavenger. I like that one. We might wait. We'll see what happens. Can the Welsh really stand up to us? Oh, the drums of war. Wales has refused to even host talks with the English over the topic of unification. Clearly, more aggressive measures will have to be utilized in order to bring about unification with Wales. Measures which the English have made clear that they would not shy away from. K.O. and his darned clique of nationalist terrorists. Terror... 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 Terrorizers will be put down. They will not stand a chance against the might of the English military. The English army will require some time to prepare, but given the time, Chaos men will all be retreating from the cause they claim they would die for. Those in England are all in one mind over how this will end. Wales will fall. If you like about beginning the process, please go right ahead, but forcing them back in. The Welsh, and their misguided pride and stubbornness, have uh, rejected our offer. Unfortunately for them, we do not accept refusal. Great Britain will be whole again, and sacrifices must be made for it to happen. We get some army XP, which is not bad either. I'll gladly take army XP. Let's grab some of that. War has become unavoidable. The Free Wales Army will no doubt be prepared to defend their homeland with a degree of ferocity few would have expected from the Welsh. If the English are to avoid all out humiliation at the hands of the FWA, more men will have to be called up to do the duty. The nation's reserves will help bring the fight to the Welsh. The generals of the English armed forces are keen to avoid the slightest chance of humiliation at the hands of the Welsh. We keep bringing the word Welsh so much. England's army may dwarf its Welsh counterpart. For this action is seen as necessary to bolster its ranks of soldiers and overwhelm the defenders of Wales, nothing will be left to chance. More must serve. Which seems like we're not going to humiliate ourselves, which is good, you know, to make sure that we don't, but... We already took out Cornwall, so I'm feeling a little better about it. Let's grab that one. Ready the RAF. One of England's greatest advantages over the Free Wales Army is the fact that it has an air force at its disposal. Limited as a Royal Air Force may be, it will still be of significant use come the time of the invasion. Therefore, more warplanes will be stationed in the airfields closest to Wales and they'll prepare to take to the skies and rain heck upon the Welsh. This may well be one of the first many times our pilots will see active combat and these men will especially need extra training before the time of the invasion. The roar of English engines would soon be heard all over Wales and one could only imagine that it would shake the Welsh people to the core. Take to the skies and let's deploy a few planes. Oh, we got the jet gas. Nice. Because we have no other planes. God dang it. 200 planes is nice. And 
testing the Walsh. Given the Walsh enduring stubbornness to accept English hegemony, a plan has been drawn up to start a small-scale attack on the Welsh border. This fight will draw out the soldiers of the Free Wells Army and enable the English to realize how capable they really are. An English victory, of course, is expected outcome. Yet in the unlikely event of FWA victory, the English army will be greatly dismayed and the government will also be embarrassed. Oh boy. Gunfire will be exchanged and soldiers will fall, but whatever the outcome, war will follow and will be much more bloody than a simple skirmish. Launch the attack. Which, using armor against these guys, your, your division is in the reserves. And all they are is infantry, so... Victory at the border. Reports have been uh, <clears throat> sent back from the Welsh border about the result of the border conflict. They conclude that little remains of the men the Free Wells Army had stationed in the area, and the attack has been a success, and the Welsh military has been significantly weakened as a result. The rest of Wales is now wide open to an attack. England has confirmed that its forces are vastly superior and will likely begin its invasion of the whole of Wales shortly. The soldiers are ready, and soon they will march on Wales. Nothing can stop them now. Wales will fall. No surprise there, my friends. Yeah, I, I didn't even cut down this up, which is nice, which is good to do. 48 billion, not bad. 46, 56 billion debt, not bueno, but it is what it is, my friends. I hate that we can't do other focuses right now. That's probably one of my biggest gripes about TNO, which doesn't have that many gripes, honestly. It's, it's, let's just say the mod itself, not the community, but the mod itself is pretty good. But, uh, I wish, I understand why you're forced to do focuses. But, I wish there were decisions. And if you didn't take these decisions, you would be severely penalized. But, war is declared. Since the outcome of the border conflict was announced, on both sides of the border, troops and civilians alike have been awaiting the start of the inevitable English invasion. The Free Wales Army has had some time to prepare, but no doubt struggled to hold off the advancing English, all the while harried by enemy aero superiority. However, the excruciating wait will soon be over. The order to attack will be ordered from the English High Command and the English Army will march into Wales. Few will regret the passing of the w FWA's grip over Wales. The dream of a Welsh Republic is long since dead and what is left will soon be put out of its misery. Death to the FWA. Oh, and uh, we need a commander here. Barker, thank you. Alright, American tanks, what can we do? Oh god, I love America. And as soon as it started... It concluded with us once again. We have done it. Wales is back in the fold. Our goal of uniting the errant former kingdoms of Britain is nearly within our grasp. Welcome back, Welshmen. We are together once again, whether you liked it or not. And I'm not even going to move our infantry because the tanks, the American tanks, have done a great job. That will uh, go over here. The Red Devils, the Old Reliables, Indian Head, Ivy, Old Hickory, the effects of unification. Now that some time has passed since unification is finally realized, its effect has started to be felt by the people of Wales, which is literally not even been a week yet, but whatever. Initially, noth nothing much has changed. The shops stayed open and they spoke the same language as before. Many even wondered what all the fuss had been about to begin with. However, this would change. English goods would fill the shelves of Welsh stores, joblessness became increasingly common, and with less people to sell to, the stores would shut down too. An influx of English arriving in the country would also make the Welsh language worthless, wiping out much of the local country with it. A way of life was passing away in front of them, one they had never thought they would miss, and there was nothing they could do to stop it from fading it away. They're stuck with us now. Well, that's not good. That's really not good. Let's get through this focus first, and then we'll click on that, so. Alright, they're stuck with us now. And making it official, is there anything else here? Hopefully we're going to deal with the terrorists. But, even though Wales is de facto under our control, technically our nations are still separate. The unification, or reunification, has made it quite a legal mess, and we must sort it out before proceeding further, which is why we shall proclaim the Kingdom of England Wales, standing, standing proudly and mighty for all the world to see. Support for Macmillan and the Libs increases. Nice. Mm, nothing here I really care about. How is the military looking? Incredibly loyal. Efficiency? It's currently 76.5. It's still going up, which is good. Got more attack, more government stability. Um, liberalize the economy. We could do that. Uh, ward the police. Yeah, we can wait on that one. Give us that civvy. I don't mind they have a little bit more support. Do we lose stability there from doing that? We might have. God dang it. As soon as that one, we did that, that pops up. Making it official, though. Now, nice, as we can do everything else now. Let's go ahead and do sub, uh, the supply lines first. Because we were doing that one off, not off screen, but together first, originally, so. Oh, we're demobilizing. Oh, that's not good. Oh, we do have Welsh terrorism. Actually, what does that do? State of the English military is very good, though. Um, Welsh terrorism. You could, oh, conservative party is doing very nice. I like that. Welsh terrorism, less group of population factor, less stability. Oh, well, that's not too bad. War support and damage garrisons goes up, but whatever. It is what it is. And then we'll do the sub stuff because I want to maximize and make sure that we are not going to get killed off by Goring. That is not good for us. Yes, no jobs. Well, how does the whole jobs thing even work? Like, I don't understand. Like, it says there'll be more jobs in certain, you know, areas of the country. But how does that work? Like, what are the mechanics behind it? Like, 
how does that influence stuff? Actually, and I was thinking about this earlier, like when I was, you know, just off screen. Like when Toolbox Theory comes out, how's that going to affect us? Especially with the whole jobs and rebuilding England, no matter who we play as. I wonder, wonder how that's going to affect us, though. Uh, we do have strengthened defenses from the Swiss, so if you like to about this for Norway, please go right ahead, send them in and materials, or modify strength and defenses, get more recruitable population factor, which we, we need, and 10% more attack and defense on core territory. I'm sorry, Norway, but England first. England first. It must be the way it is. And rebuild the British Navy. Everything is ready. The technologies are researched. The blueprints are made. Now we can begin the momentous task. A task that must be done, but a task every Englishman will be glad to take on. To the yards, shipbuilders of Britain. We will lay a hole in every slipway, in every town, in every port. The Iowa will ring with sound of smashing bottles and new ships sliding into the water. Recruiting stations from Dover to the border will be jammed with men who will sail the Atlantic on new, modern vessels. Let the Hun know that the Britannia's charter grants it the seas, and will defend the approaches to our lands as much as the land itself. Dockyard output plus 75%, not bad. Actually, that's really good. Too bad we don't have any uh, good stuff to use. Let's see. Trade. We need some chromium. Uh, let's trade with... Let's improve relations with Indians. Uh, just get one. One to be good enough. And let's, let's get two of these. And yeah, yes, that'd be good. Because overall, that's not too bad what we got so here, so far here. Uh, can we build? Yes. Build all the stuff up first. Build up all the civvies first. That's, actually, we're building up even some of the stuff too. Which is nice. Uh, the roads don't matter too much. Welsh roads. We don't believe in roads for the Welsh. Uh, let's see. Industrial Giants. Good. And we'll re uh, ooh, unemployment stuff. We got more cities again. Not bad. And a re rebuilt armed forces. Then, a group of ceremonial units and militia with surplus weaponry. Now, a modern and efficient fighting force. Then, a group of su half-sunk ships, mothballed in harbors and estuaries. Now, a shining and magnificent fleet of patrol vessels and subs. One may be astonished at how quickly we have turned things around, but they don't know the tenacity of the Breton. We love our land and are prepared to bore any hardship, make any sacrifice, and to keep it. Now we may rest comfortably that when trouble comes, our lads are capable of handling it. We get our built armed forces, more army XP gain, nice. Max command power, great. Starting attack level of the leaders goes up, and where are they now? England's Chata, though. Once we get some more jobs. Nice, not bad. The British Navy was once the strongest and largest in the world. Dominating the world since the age of sail, the Navy has been a legendary and terrifying force. Every man can recall the names and heroism of Drake, Nelson, and Cook. Memories of the HMS Victory still stirred the hearts, and the name HMS Dreadnought would still deliver chills to some. Like the sun never setting on the British Empire, there were nary an ocean in the world where the British fleet would not be patrolling the waves. Then the war happened. What once had once terrified the world was on the bottom of the ocean, laid low by bombs or torpedoes. Peace was more devastating. Many ships now flew under different flags, those of Scotland, the Commonwealth, the Oath, and all now independent of London. The vanquishers of the British fleet scrapped what ships left that had been deemed a threat and the mothballed the rest so England would never have its fabled weapon again. But this was the new era. Those in London today would not be cowed by the Teutonic threats. Now they would be making sure that no enemy force could land on England again and subjugate the people of the Isle. In shipyards across the nation, people lined up to build what the occupiers had said they could not. No agreement made under duress whether not to see beasts would be respected now. Thousands of shipyard workers took their tools up and marched into the dockyards. Every dry dock would have a hole in it, and if it didn't, there would be one. Looking at the first ship sailing out of the historic dockyard of Portsmouth. Even those with the faintest memories of the British Empire could hardly suppress their smiles at the memory of the line, Rule Britannia, Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. Unless they want to be, you know, you know on a consensual basis. Cool, and I'm glad we, we can get this one done, hopefully, before Goring says, Hello there! I don't know why he'd say hello there, but whatever. Oh, English good in foreign countries. Oh, that's not bad! I like that a lot! Oh, I want to rush that one. We can wait for that stuff. Since we already got that stuff done, which is great. In agreement with Iceland. Oddly, all of our neighbors, we've had some particularly vicious disputes over Iceland, over fish, fishing rights in the North Sea over the recent years. Perhaps when England was a part of the UK, this could have been solved by us alone, but at the moment we lack the power to enforce anything over the nation in Europe most heavily aligned with the OFM. Therefore, let us meet with Icelandic representatives for some talks over fishing quotas and territorial waters. With the Americans backing their talks, we'll likely find a more equitable agreement than anything we'll get on our own. Oh, and perhaps a gesture of friendship. Like a treaty of non-hostility will help sweeten the deal. It won't mean anything, since we will never actually be in a position to engage in hostilities with Iceland, but it'll certainly look good in a formal deal. Nice. Better, uh, trucks. Why not? Minus 1.2 billion? Very good. A rebuilt on forces. Ah, where are they now, though, my friends? Once we get some more technology done first. Good. What Sergeant Booth 
When he entered the Royal Army, he was given a rifle that might have been well tossed into the sands in Dunkirk and recently washed ashore. The definition of a defensive position was a foxhole, and a fortified position was really a deep foxhole. Today, Sergeant Booth's squad is outfitted with machine guns and modern rifles. They are also satisfied with a concrete position overlooking Margate. Petty Officer Powell's first assignment was in a rusting submarine from the Second World War. It looked like it belonged at the bottom of the ocean. There were fears that it would really stay there the next dive. Powell no longer needed to fear his assignment, however. He is now quite comfortable on this new sub, one that is considerably faster, armed, and more habitable than his original posting. Flight Sergeant Foster didn't think he would be in any sort of Royal Air Force if he joined the military, even if he did. He fully expected to be flying prop-driven aircraft. He believed that he would end up in the Army like everyone else. Well, that's funny sometimes. He now flies a modern jet fighter and can claim to be a pilot like his father was back in the war. All across Britain, there are men like Booth, Powell, and Foster, men of the British Armed Forces. Granted, the ability to be far more effective and strong than they thought possible. No longer is it a token force. It's an efficient force, a powerful force, and a force ready to stand up to anyone who wants to crush the isle underneath their jackboot. We'll fight and we'll conquer again and again. And English goods on foreign shelves. Although our once mighty industrial sector might have been laid low by the wartime bombings and the following German exploitation of our economy, it was not extinguished entirely. From sea tea bags and biscuits to coal, coal hulls and ship hulls, our industrial our industry still produces what it can with the raw materials it has been able to access. Leveraging our contacts with global firms, we can increasingly market these goods as outside of Europe providing for sorely needed influx of liquid cash that the local firms and the government can reinvest into revitalizing our secondary and tertiary economic sectors. England shall know wealth once more, which looks great. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Every own state, medium increase in economic output, more jobs, yes, yes, yes. Not bad. A lot of PP. All right, meet with who? Reducing unemployment, and then we'll do that one next. So that's good. The protection is something beautiful, which we would love to do, which we need to do all this stuff next time as well. In the next episode, so. Mm, promise them acts and win them over. A better education act. Oh. Yeah, I do want to do some of these acts. The bribery. Huh. Okay. Reach out to old friends. There's something I really want to do. Looking over the floor. I kind of want to wait for this one later. Um, Reaching out to old friends. The old friends have really been content to ignore us since the war ended. Or when they haven't ignored us, they have been providing guns to the communists and SAS. Now, the armed resistance has failed, and we have gotten the Germans off our back. Perhaps now is the time for a reset in our relationship. We'll make it clear that we're the best chance England has now for a free future, one where people no longer are hounded by fascism, and have a high degree of liberty. We can be an extremely valuable member of the OFN and slide into the role we once held when we were aligned together. It's time to make the calls. Good, good, good. And we keep making more millies, good. We got another millie. Land down under. Greatest ally. Let's go ahead and keep going down this way. Uh, Templar, loyalty. Um, hmm. Hunt with Templar. Or Templar. Gerard. Gerard Templar has long served the English lo or England loyally, and his crucial role in preventing the foul organization Himmler from winning the Civil War has only increased the regard for him in the political classes, however. Templar never really got along with all that well with us civilian officials, no, ma no small part due to our position on the matter of throwing away German restrictions on the military apparatus. With UE's new defensive foreign policy focus, however, it might be possible to bring Mr. Templar on board with our agenda. We can speak of it while it's on a fox hunt, which the man is known to love, especially on the subject of our current military strength and how that might be improved. Even in the worst case scenarios, though, what what harm could a little chat do? Ooh, and we have something here. Yes, yes, please, yes. Liberalize, yes. Oh, do that one first. So, uh, unemployment. Yes, very good. Okay, then. Um, after that one, then we'll go ahead and do... Here we go again. Sure. More than 30 years of political experience have made Harold Macmillan into a master of the parliamentary battlegrounds. Working from behind the scenes, the men in the background ensured that the royal party didn't grow too abusive in their pursuit of power while keeping the Germans' minds as far from England as possible. Now Macmillan is much the same situation, the vital pillar on which PM Maldine's support rests, ensuring that the U in United England works in a smooth and efficient manner in regards to government whilst keeping the National Front and relic royal party disorganized. Helped by the fact that much of New United England is loyal to him personally, Macmillan will keep our nation on a steady, steady course. Nice. Oh god, we need a lot of this. Uh, there you go. You can have three. You can go down by three there. There you go. Alright, not bad. And we'll do this one, and then we'll read one more, and then we'll probably finish it out. The back bench liberals. An unsteady crown. Already rumor. <clears throat> It's spreading throughout the aisles of the uh, fate of King Henry the Ninth. Only recently cor coronated, the king is already a hot topic of discussion, as he may or may not have been crippled so shortly into his reign by deliberating stroke. 
The exact cause is unknown, but unscrupulous papers and even less scrupulous public are ablaze with talk of yet another king in so short a period of time. Is the regency required? Is he being held hostage? Was Henry leading a monarchist coup to restore England and invade Wales, only to be stopped by the military who have now put him up against the wall and shot him, only to be stopped by the PM who is also incapacitated but who has escaped and will cause a second civil war? Of course, the truth is well known to be close to Henry. It is unlikely that the new king will last much longer, ending any speculation about his health. Leaving aside the graveling headlines, most people are simply devastated to have the threat of a chaotic change foisted upon them, especially since Henry seemed to be a more stable king than the last and much more popular. My gosh, not again! Not again, please, not again, but we're gonna have it again. <clears throat> Loyalty 101, and here we go again, but the effects of unification. Um. Uh, I think I've already read this one, so if you want to read about this one again, please go right ahead, so it's not too bad. Loyalty 101. Gerald Templar's hand caught the chairman's chest, catching him before Macmillan could stumble into a rabbit hole. It's hardly a landmine, sir, but I assure you that you will be happier watching your step, Templar said, patting Macmillan on the shoulder and then walking ahead into the forest, his hunting rifle in him. Macmillan grimaced and hurriedly caught up to his hunting companion, piles of dead leaves crunching under his soft leather shoes as he did so. Marshal, I've been looking for the best time to ask you a question, Macmillan said. You mean we weren't here merely to catch a fox, Prime Minister? Color me shocked and dismayed, sir, said Templar. Don't be snide, Marshal, said the chairman, scanning through the tree line. I need your opinion. What's the best way to prevent another civil war? It's nothing complicated, sir. Have a big army to deter your enemies and give your allies what they need so they will stay your allies. Macmillan eyed his companion suspiciously as he boastfully slandered through the forest. And if I were to want my, you as my ally, Marshal, what would you say you wanted? Templar dropped low onto one knee, pointing a careful finger to a flash of red fur. You see, I'm rather easy to please, Chairman, he said in a low whisper as he snapped his rifle to, up to aim at the prey. As I said, you need a big army, you need to give your allies what they want, and all I want is a big army. Templar's shot rang throughout the forest. Two birds with one stone, then. Very good, and uh, I'd like one more. Let's read one more so we can do it off screen, uh, and then we can come back with a little event. You know, I do kind of want to finish this up as fast as possible. Royal party support will decrease, national support will decrease. That's not bad. I like that as well. Oh, yes, 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 more influence. Maybe we'll go with the Anti-Bribery Act. So, looking over the floor. The English opposition is the single biggest collection of liars, frauds, and criminals that have ever had the dishonor to sit in Parliament. And the royal party are the corrupt, the arrogant sellouts who, if they had their own way, would have us still answering to Germany in full. Far from their once lofty heights, the royal party is a disgraceful institution that ought to be put to rest. Then we have the National Front. Mere words cannot describe the utter hatred United England has for those disgusting, wretched, feculent pieces, or feculent pieces of refuse. Worse than wanting out uh, subordination to the Reich, worse than, than the thousands that betrayed to Germany is their true allegiance. Fascism. If we have to fight for a thousand years to ensure the National Front will never gain power, it'll be worth a thousand well spent. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we continue restoring English glory, and maybe even joining the OFM, and hopefully fighting off Goring, the fat man. Thanks for watching, have a great, great rest of your day.